So I've had uh, the good fortune of being able to drag both Catalina and Peter to, uh, to Africa twice in the last year, and hopefully we'll drag many more ACFO associates there more often in the coming years because the work has been pretty valuable. Uh, so I work for Mars Global Chocolate, and Mars is a uh, food and snacks company. Actually, we own the largest chocolate factory in the world. It's right here in the Netherlands, in Vekkel. Well, driving by, you'd probably never notice it. Uh, and so mostly what I get asked is, well, so Mars makes Snickers and the Mars Bar and M&Ms, lots of very sort of everyday consumer products. Why in the hell would you invest a lot of money in agricultural programs? Or why would you even be thinking about farmers? Uh, and the fact is, every single one of our products is based on some plant that grows somewhere in the ground. Right? So I, I thought, since we have a lot of open data and we have a lot of technology and all that stuff is cool, I thought I would excite you all with some basic agronomy. Right? No, nobody doesn't like some agronomy in the afternoon after, after lunch. <laughs> right. So really, why are we here? The reason we're here is chocolate. Yes, and I don't have to explain the importance of chocolate to anybody from the Netherlands. That speaks for itself. Uh, Mars has been making chocolate for about 100 years under the same name, under the same family. We like things to be consistent. As a big corporation, you know, change is, change is good. And yet some of the important things we like to stay the same. The sustainability efforts have come out of that philosophy of, OK, well, we have a good business. Consumers like our products. What's going to change in the next 50 to 100 years that we should, we should be worried about? Right? And so if we want to keep having a lot of chocolate coming out uh, for consumers in the future, we really need to be worried about this, cocoa. So chocolate comes from uh, cocoa beans. And you see the beans are uh, stacked up there in some really, it's, it's this fruity pulp stuff. It's delicious. You never get to taste it because it gets turned into chocolate. Uh, it grows on pods on the cocoa tree. You can see in the background. This one is from, from Ghana and looks pretty, it's really ripe. This is the cocoa tree itself. This is a beautiful specimen. Uh, this is on an agricultural research station in Ecuador. This uh, tree is actually, I mean, if you took this to like a cocoa tree fancier club, this would probably win first prize. So this has been bred over several generations. It's, it's a clone, uh, not in the you know, made in the lab sense, but in like the Gregor Mendel has been bred uh, sense. It's bred, to be, it's bred to be precocious and highly productive. This tree is only two years old. And you see it's really well formed and it's already covered in pods. If you showed this to a cocoa farmer in Africa, he would be insanely jealous. This is also, similarly, a really nice looking uh, cocoa plantation in Indonesia. You see the trees are spaced out very nicely on a three meter grid. They're not too high. They've been grafted with clonal material. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's very well kept, right? So this, these are, those are sort of the ideal things that's what we're dealing with. It's a tree crop. It takes lots of land area. It takes lots of time. And it takes the usual uh, farm resources. It takes fertilizer. It takes labor. It takes uh, a bit of marketing and some, uh, some overall maintenance. So those look nice. However, uh, most of the cocoa doesn't come from Ecuador, where we found the really nice cocoa tree specimen, nor does it come from Indonesia, where we find some pretty nicely rehabilitated, laid out farms. 70% of all the world's cocoa comes from West Africa. The largest chunk of that uh, from Cote d'Ivoire. Mm -hmm. Why is that a problem? Well, we'll, get, we'll come to that. Yes, child labor is a part of the future. I mean, you know, yes, thank you for bringing that up. Labor is one aspect of an agricultural system that has broken down for lack of investment over 50 to 100 years. Right? So in this, you can see that in this example. This is a pretty typical cocoa growing community, Kragi. Uh, it's, a, it's a village of about 3,000 people. Very, very diverse, Guineans, Burkinabe, uh, other internal immigrants as well that came in the 70s and 80s when the economic boom was on. Right now, here we are today, not much has changed. They're still dependent on cocoa as a crop, right? But yields are declining. There hasn't been much reinvestment. So this is the kind of environment where cocoa is coming out, right? So poverty is one of the main problems. One of the symptoms of poverty will be a reliance on family labor in which inappropriate practices can be exacerbated, among other things. Then if we step over to the farm, this does not look like the tree we saw in Ecuador. So this tree is 20 years old or so, probably has never benefited from fertilizer or pruning or anything like that. And it's been, it's been grown just from whatever the farmer could find. 
you know, his neighbor or his father had some trees. He scooped some seeds out and he planted them and that, that was it. So sometimes the tree will be good and productive and resistant to disease. Most of the time, however, it will be not. So he'll have a few trees on his farm that produce really well and the rest that look like this. Now that the, the plantations are between 20 and 30 years old, they're basically falling apart. The trees are dying, they're diseased, the farm is yielding less and less cocoa over time, so the farmer has less and less money to reinvest in it. And so we're not seeing this grid, right? You, you know, to see the farmer hasn't, hasn't known to prune, right? He hasn't put any fertilizer in the ground, and he, he kind of picks up whatever he can to get some money to, to, to support his family. Really, all this is inherited. Again, in the 70s and 80s across West Africa, people expanded to the West, took up new land, cut down the rainforest, planted cocoa and other crops. Now we're into the second and third generation, and they've never really been trained as farmers. They know that a buyer will come out to them twice a year, and they can get money for the pods, but nobody has been able to train them to prune their trees, uh, to rehabilitate with uh, good planting material, all that stuff. So all this adds up uh, to this. So this is the kind of the leading indicator for, for businesses who rely on, on cocoa, right? For the past 100 years, demand for cocoa has gone up about 2 to 3% a year, just based on existing demand. So if you just have Europe and the U.S. and the developed world eating the same amount, more or less, with population growth, you'll have a 3% increase. Okay. So this is conservative because India and China are now getting a taste for chocolate. So the demand for cocoa isn't a problem. Yet we're, we're completely maxed out on land area. There is no new space for us to expand production. And the farmers that we have now are, are, are really struggling. So that's where Mars comes in, and, and indeed the entire chocolate industry. We're literally at a point where if we don't invest now, if everybody doesn't invest now, there's not going to be enough of this stuff to go around. And you know the, the $8, $9 a bar um, premium niche brand is, is all you're going to be able to find. And, you know, I make a decent living, but I can't pay $9 for a chocolate bar. And a few people want to or are willing to. So that's some bad news. Some good news is we actually know, we know kind of why this is happening. As I said before, cocoa hasn't had a lot of investment. Right? It doesn't have the same kind of support structures that uh, wheat or rice or our, probably everybody's favorite whipping boy in agriculture does, corn. And yield is, a, is another good leading indicator. So corn... Just, you know, every plant has limits you can take it to. Corn is at about 60%, which is, which is huge. Uh, cocoa, however, is about 10%. Right? So if you look at world average yields, currently they're about uh, half a ton per hectare, if you're lucky. You know, some, more between, some can go as low as 200 kgs a hectare. But so we know, though, from just agronomic research, that we can increase yield by, by a factor of three over three and a half years. If you train the farmer, you get a, a small increase. If you put on some fertilizer, you can repair some of the damage that's been done to the soil as well as enable these extra predictivity gains. But by far and away, the biggest thing you can do is to have a good breeding program that creates hardy plants, a variety of them genetically, uh, that, that yield more cocoa and rehabilitate the farms with those. It's actually really interesting that it has, this hasn't been done before. So this is a grafted uh, seedling. So what's actually done is you'll breed these what are called bud sticks, literally just sticks with a couple of leaves on them. You can make an incision into the old tree, insert it in, tie it off so it becomes sterile, and in a couple of months the graft will take. So that branch is actually genetically distinct from the trunk it's attached to, which is pretty cool. So in a couple of, uh, of months the graft will be stable enough that you can cut down the original tree. So you can imagine, though, you're, you're coming into a, a rural African context. The farmer is, uh, is maybe not as enthusiastic about that, right? They say, hey, I got this great idea. I'm going to stick a branch onto your old cocoa tree and then cut down your farm. How about it? <laughs> well, so actually what you have to start with is, is this. Like, look, take my word for it, okay? If you do this in 18 months, you could have a, a tree that looks like this. And it really isn't, and this isn't, this is from Indonesia where grafting and rehabilitation has, uh, has been around for a longer period of time where we piloted kind of early versions of this intervention. 
So the idea in Africa is to start not with, hey, let's just let's graft everything, because people just aren't aren't ready to accept that. The, the idea is to demonstrate progress like this, and then find a way for local communities to to take that up themselves and uh, and support it through a, a more formal uh, either commercial or, or public uh, extension service. And we can we can get into more of those details if if you like. Broadly, however, I think this is kind of the unique perspective Mars has on uh, the theory of change. So we're a business. We don't know how to do aid projects. We'd be pretty bad at it, to be honest with you. That's not really what we know how to do. That's not what we're set up. But we are good at business. You know, we know broadly how economies work. We know how markets work. We know how businesses can work. So when we thought about what we could contribute to help uh, get the cocoa sector at the local level back on its feet, this is what we came up with. We said, well, see, we have a lot of technical knowledge about cocoa production. If we were able to transfer that to the farmers in an effective way to triple their yields, so that, that's a 300% raw income increase, although there's other, there's other factors there, then couldn't we build a program around capturing some of that income, making sure it was staying in the local community, and addressing a specific agenda of development needs? So on the one hand, we have this you know, agronomic aspect that we're pretty familiar with. On the other hand, we, we've tried to bring together each of the communities that we're working with so they understand what's happening. Uh, so they understand there is going to be a program to increase productivity on the local farms and that they can organize to take advantage of it. So in Cote d'Ivoire, we're lucky to have a really um, knowledgeable local partner called Anadere. That's a French acronym for um, like the Rural Development Assistance Program. Uh, and so they go into the communities around our, our center, our cocoa centers. They let them know there's a program and they give them a template for local organizing. So they say, well, wouldn't it be a good idea if you formed a development committee, identified your priorities, and then collected a small amount of money to, to help fund them. And then the rest of the funding can come from the, the government, Mars, and other donors. So we're in about 55 communities at this point, three years into the program. And um, we have about 350 micro projects uh, identified. So by 2020, uh, Vision for Change is, is looking at, well, we call it a pilot, but you know, there's this question of scale that was brought up earlier. We thought a, a reasonable pilot to go to scale would be 150,000 farmers over 10 years. So we have 17 cocoa development centers in 55 communities. And by 2020, uh, we'd like to have 25 uh, cocoa development centers plus 50 additional cocoa development centers built by partners to reach a total of 150,000 farmers in, uh, in Cote d'Ivoire. So I might fall down because I think I've talked a little bit too much, but that's pretty much the, um, the meat of, of the Mars program. Yeah, it's just a little bit, a little summary. So and again, and coming back to that million tons, that's, that's, that's where all links together. Um, to talk a bit about how ACFO comes into that in, in kind of data, I think that's really the next phase of thinking for us. Uh, reasonable people uh, can disagree about the technical approach, about uh, addressing poverty and, and the way to create a sustainable cocoa industry. But from our perspective, we, we feel like we have a pretty good technical grasp of how the agronomy of cocoa works and how to bring that technology into farmers. Uh, at least enough of a start and enough of a learning program to get there. What we don't have a grasp on is how the entire industry is going to work together to exchange those learnings and somehow act together over the next 10 to 20 years, either for this crisis or for the, for the next one, which is why technologies like ACFO are really interesting to us. Because when I go into the Anadair office in, in the Subre province of, of Cote d'Ivoire, I find a whole lot of paper forms, and I find uh, a whole lot of people who are uh, really well-trained and really well-meaning, but they, they don't have the time or the capacity to share information uh, laterally you know, with their other partner groups. And it'll take them a couple of months to get us information about uh, their activities to say nothing of, of the impact. So for me, you know, I, could, I could sit here and, and talk to you all day about what the proper uh, rate of fertilizer is for, for cocoa farms, microfinancing, and all that stuff. But the next, um, the next frontier for us really is this open information frontier. You know, so if we look at our commercial cocoa buying program, 
what is going to be proprietary and what is going to be what is going to be public out of vision for change what is going to be valuable for the development world at large and and how do we share it how do we qualify uh, all of our programs and make sure that everybody is able to, to benefit from them. So that's the open question I, I, I put to you guys and that's the reason I'm excited to, to be here and, and to be on the forefront. I really think ACFO is one of those organizations that has seen what the next step is and uh, I'm only too happy to put them on a plane so they can go and, and implement that uh, at the origins. So with that I, I've tried to leave enough time for, uh, for some questions. Yes. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I was wondering, uh, that's what you know, uh, after to gather information, that's a great. Mm -hmm. I was wondering how you are uh, working with uh, the farmer to get this technology transfer. Are you doing it with the NGO that you mentioned in a traditional way? Mm -hmm. or with your space space meeting? Or are you also making use of this technology? Ah. Do you got my question? Yeah, so the, the question was, uh, are we using uh, traditional methods for technology transfer, or are we taking advantage of new technologies? Primarily traditional, uh, so especially in Cote d'Ivoire, um, infrastructure is not dependable. Uh, so the most of the uh, areas we're working in do not have electricity, or don't have a lot of technology penetration. Now they will, uh, which is why, again, we're kind of looking ahead. Um, mostly traditional. So you have uh, an agronomic demonstration center. And then if there's any training that happens, it'll happen in person. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about bringing in new technologies. And the World Cocoa Foundation has a program called CocoLink in Ghana that will provide information uh, via SMS to farmers. Uh, the cost of that program, you know, we're not really sure if that's going to scale up industry-wide. Um, and that's really the only one that I know that I know of that, that takes into account any kind of recent technology. Um, I, I think it's a gap for us, to be honest with you. I, I think we're, we are going to rely on tr traditional methods for the foreseeable future. We're, we're not quite sure. Uh, I, I think for myself, the reason I'm cautious about that is I know from my perspective what I think would be useful to a farmer in the field. I have no idea what he thinks. So, you know, I, I would want to wait for a time when we could get a better sense of what's going to be useful to them. So if there are some tools that will be uh, coming through other avenues, so if mobile payments, for example, come from East Africa to West Africa, which I think they will soon, uh, then I think we'll have a better understanding of, of what those farmers have an appetite for. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, we, we can help you to find out what's Oh, fantastic. Well, wow, perfect. <laughs> other questions? Yeah, a very tricky question. Do you think uh, that by implementing your theory of change, you'll, you'll be filling the gap? And if yes, we finish which yes? Uh, which gap? You show the gap showing that between the actual production ah, and the need. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, Chinese and India coming in, they will eat every all the chocolate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there'll, be, there'll be enough for everybody. Don't, don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> no. So, do you think by in, you know implementing the theory of change, how many here are you going to fill the gap? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the because big question. Yeah. Because you are thirty-five percent. Yeah. So how you know how much are you planning to increase the production in Cote d'Ivoire or maintaining it or you know what yeah. the big deal for the no. theory of change there? Well, it's impossible to predict with any kind of certainty. I mean, one, it's a tree crop, so anything you put in the ground now is going to reach full production for another two or three years. So you kind of have a sense of well, I, I don't know exactly how much this is going this is going to go to. Um, and it's not only going to be Cote d'Ivoire. There are there are going to be other origins that produce more or come online. Uh, Indonesian capacity is increasing. You're seeing some cocoa production start to come out more in the Philippines and Vietnam. Uh, South American production is also picking up uh, a little bit. I mean, it, it's more a question of either stabilizing or, or raising all of the origins. Um, and, you know, not, not becoming too focused on the actual production numbers. Since to a certain extent the market will regulate itself uh, as long as the capacity exists. The problem is in Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana and, and many other origins, there's just not 
there's not capacity to, to build more production. And, it, and the production that exists is pretty inefficient if you look at it on a per hectare basis. Right? So the idea is that uh, you want to create that kind of foundational capacity that will allow those countries to meet whatever demand happens to be your, or come near it. I mean, and, and land use is, is a big part of that. So if, you, if you're able to produce the same amount of cocoa on a third or a quarter of the land, all this, you, you, know, you could continue to grow cocoa, or you could diversify into other crops to have a more uh, stable income mix or, or switch to food crops. Yeah. Do you have any idea why the farmers don't do what you're saying? Well, it's not a, yeah, it's not a question of not doing what, what we're saying. Uh, it's a question of access and scale. There are uh, between 600 and 750,000 cocoa farmers in Cote d'Ivoire alone, and between five and six million all over the world. So reaching all of them in a consistent manner is not a small task. I think in the programs in the past, we have seen increasing success. Uh, but it, you, you, we've had to choose. Either we get programs that are really technically successful, you know, in terms of depth, they get a, a good impact, or we get programs that are, that are successful in terms of scale. They reach a lot of people. To date, we haven't been able to do both, right? So it's, it's really not the, it's not, the farmers aren't to blame at all. It's not that they're unable to absorb the knowledge or, you know, anything like that. It's more like either they don't have access to it because of their remoteness or, or something else, or um, you know, the, the program just isn't isn't scoped for it. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's not it's not necessarily a question of agriculture. It's a question of whether you give the farmers some uh, assurance of future income. Whether mm -hmm. if they invest in fertilizer, then they will do that if they are sure that somehow it will come back to them. Oh, yeah. And, and th those uh, farmers in Africa, like everywhere else in the world, have a very good reasoning as how to survive. Yeah. And they work in much more difficult circumstances than we live. Mm -hmm. um, so I, th I think if you find out, and, and the reasons can be specific for each area, within each country there are specific areas where specific reasons are existing why farmers do certain things. If you find out those reasons, then you have to put much less eff uh, Imp what is it, uh, effort in the rest of your program. Mm -hmm. If you have a good marketing system for them and they get a good price, they'll do much more than when you, uh, when you send, up, uh, send out a, a middleman uh, who, who pays mm -hmm. them only mm -hmm. half. But I think those are reasons behind the, 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 the operation of the farm. Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, the farmers are rational, they're intelligent. If you show them how to do something that will benefit them and, and make them more money, in general, they will do it. Sometimes it takes a little bit of convincing, but the most convincing thing for a farmer is demonstration, right? That, that's really what we're focused on. We're not focused on telling or convincing. So the first thing we did with Envision for Change was create demonstration plots where they can see side by side what the different interventions can do. And the farmer knows what a good cocoa farm looks like. So when he sees the demonstration plot that looks really good, that's been grafted and uses fertilizer, he says, well, how do I get that? Where do I go? So that, that's the whole idea behind it. And in Indonesia, again, where we started the the first version of this kind of package of interventions, uh, maybe 10 years ago, it happened very quickly. You know, the neighbors would uh, show each other different practices, and it, it took off on its own. So we're, we're, we're hopeful. It's not going to be fast, but we do think that demonstration will be effective, as you say. Yeah. close this gap, uh, you need the whole sector to come together and uh, make yeah. a change. Uh, is it part of, part of your initiative to work together with other businesses, with huge cocoa farmers? Mm -hmm. Because you are not the only chocolate uh, company, yeah. of course. And I wonder if it's, of course, maybe a, a conflict of interest for you or or you, you work together and you share ideas that we are doing mm -hmm. it here. Are you doing it also on your uh, yeah. suppliers? Yeah, that's under development. I mean, like you say, there, there is some, some hesitancy. Um, it's not easy for me to call up my counterpart at Nestle, for example, and have a pretty candid chat. <laughs> there are other concerns yeah. there as well. So it's a, it's a question of agenda. It's also a question of a forum. 
you know, what is the right place? And if you can't have direct relationships, then, you know, is there a facilitator that, that can do that? And in the past, I think we've seen some limited success with industry organizations, uh, ICCO, uh, I think it's the International Cocoa Organization based in London, uh, World Cocoa Foundation uh, based in Washington, D.C. But I think we, there is some frustration there because they just, they just don't go quite far enough. You know, you, you can agree on some high-level things, but in terms of field implementation and effectiveness and monitoring, you know, you need a, you need a deeper kind of cooperation. I think we're getting to the point now where we've all realized that. Nobody disagrees, uh, but the mechanics are a bit more sophisticated. So I would expect us to go in that direction, but as to the specifics, I, I'd say they're, they're being worked out you know, now. I'm impressed by uh, the amount of investments that uh, are done. And I understand <laughs> also that the technology transfer is very effective and it's very simple as you present it. Um, the link to ACFO is what I have a question uh, mm -hmm. about. So you want to measure data. Uh, I'm just wondering about what kind of KPIs or what kind of indicators you mm -hmm. want to measure in the field. And second question is, to what extent is your circle of influence because you're now focusing primarily on the agricultural aspects but we mm -hmm. talked also about labor and on microfinance so yeah to what expand, uh, ex extent is your circle of influence okay well so the first part of the question uh what are we interested in measuring different things for different purposes uh so vision for change was uh conceived as a way to create a donor model, basically. We wanted to do a pilot that was large enough and was measured uh, extensively enough that we could take to a large international donor like the World Bank or IMF later on and say, okay, well, we've proven this, so with a little bit of funding, you could take this to every other cocoa origin in the world. Uh, so there's a set of agronomic indicators, right, looking at the performance of different clonal materials, different fertilizer applications, uh, how many farmers are participating in the program, uh, there's a layer of the program that's focused on local entrepreneurship, right? So we knew we wouldn't, we would never have the resources as Mars or as any other uh, external organization to provide every farmer everywhere with what he needs. But we can create a business model that allows uh, a local Ivorian or local Ghanaian or Indonesian to, you know, sell or finance fertilizer, to uh, sell rehabilitation and grafting services to local cocoa farmers and planting material and that kind of thing, and actually create another layer of, uh, of business there. And so, you know, we're also looking at those performance indicators about the number of plants moved through the system, the amount of fertilizer that's, that's coming on, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, and the second part of the question about our circle of influence, I, I think it's, it's sort of, well, it depends on the way you look at it. Um, so the most important people to us are the consumers, right, and our customers. So that would be major retailers and then, you know, the end user who is eating a Snickers bar and you want him to be satisfied with, uh, with that. But then, you know, if you look further down the supply chain, then we are actually the customer of, of some very large exporters and suppliers uh, and others. So we have, you know, less influence on what the consumers and our customers want. And we have slightly more influence on what our uh, vendors deliver to us. So our sphere of influence is really is, is strongest at those, those two endpoints, right? So we have a, a, the best idea of what our customers want from us directly, and then you know what we can ask for directly from, from our suppliers. Um, yeah? Just to make a, a, a great example, how sure. far do you go, where does it end? For instance, you train them on technology or how to, to uh, mm -hmm. prune the trees, for instance. Yeah. But uh, one of the um, well the challenges maybe in the future is that their children don't want to follow up as a farmer, sure. for instance. Yeah. So a good education system or good development in the region is in the long term also relevant to your yeah. equation. Yeah. But I can imagine that it stops somewhere. You mean what's uh, our on helping a farmer uh, mm. increase their crops and and create uh, development for itself? So where yeah. where does it yeah. end, or what is within what you want to do within your farmer's program? Yeah, I think our our interest and in impact is holistic. We want to see progress on everything you described. 
So when we do larger impact studies, the longer term longitudinal studies, we'll be looking at all aspects of community welfare, for sure, education, health, sanitation, uh, income level, agronomic level, all those things. In terms of responsibility, though, I think one of our great realizations was we can't do it all. We don't have the exper expertise, we don't have the financing, we don't have the organization to do it. So when we decided where our focus was going to be in terms of activity, it was on capacity building. So we don't want to create a system in which uh, people are relying on, on Mars to be there, right? We want to be really involved on the front end and try to create some systems that will be self-sustaining, you know, hence the focus on the local entrepreneurship model and building out uh, an extension service that will live on beyond Mars. At the same time, though, you know, theory of change is predicated on productivity being the central piece of this, driving incomes and also feeding into that uh, cycle of community development. But, you know, we don't know that for sure. There's going to be variation. There's going to be some, some learning along the way. Uh, so we have the idea now that productivity will be central and it will drive a more uh, holistic set of changes. But that's exactly what we're going to be measuring over the next, the next five to ten years. Other questions? Well, just uh, one, sure. <laughs> one more uh, about this holistic view. Uh -huh. um, you can measure progress, uh, but could also use, for instance, Aquaflow Flow to gain insights uh -huh. what to improve instead of only monitoring and evaluation. Yeah. Do you see Aquaflow also as a tool to create new insights for improvement? Yes, absolutely. I mean, if it were up to me, there'd be a phone in, in every village and we'd be getting, you know, daily or monthly sort of updates about what's going on. Okay, it's not up to me, but I, I think we're making inroads about some of that continuous monitoring. I think because it was designed as a larger scale learning program, they went with a traditional M&E uh, approach that would be accepted by sort of everybody in that, in that world. Uh, as we move on to more of a operational view, I think tools like Flow will play a larger role. I, I think in the last year or so, we've gotten some comfort with the new tools, and now you know it's time to let those little trials grow a bit internally so that we can impress and, and convince people going forward to, to use them more often. Oh. We're good? Years ago, it was quite difficult to move cacao from Cote d'Ivoire, basically, because of the political crisis and mm -hmm. so on. Um, what do you think, uh, in the coming year, implementing your vision of change, if something happened, how mm -hmm. it will affect the whole t vision of change that you are yeah. planning in Cote d'Ivoire? It would no doubt have an effect. It had an effect two years ago when the program was just underway. Uh, I think fortunately for us and everybody involved in the program, again, we chose not to manage it directly ourselves, right? We went through a qualified implementing uh, partner, the World Agroforestry Center, uh, ICRAF, which is based in Nairobi and has a variety of projects around the world. They're very good and they have diplomatic status. So they were able to continue operating a, on a limited basis within, you know, the regional boundaries of safety for their staff and things like that. They were able to continue operating at a basic level throughout that crisis. Uh, so hopefully that will not happen again. We have great faith in, in the new administration. We've seen some really positive reforms over the last two years. But should uh, some difficulty like that break out hypothetically in the future, uh, you know, we feel as confident as we could that the whole program won't be destroyed. That at the worst it would be reduced to a very basic level of functioning as it was in the 2009-2010 in the crisis. Well. Ready? Okay, well, thank you, everybody. It's been great.